Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. That's my sound man right there. <laughs> Hi, y'all. I'm Katie. I am an alcoholic. And you know, it's funny, Charlie and I have been married for a couple of years, and I always have to hesitate there on the, for not been part long, so you have to remember who you are. Um, I've had the gift of sobriety since October the 28th of 1984, and for that I am so grateful. Thank you so much. I uh, had to get my little world set up here. Boy, I'm still reeling from Kip's talk. Geez, I, I think I might have to go talk to my sponsor. <laughs> you know, and after it was over, while bingo was going on, I don't know if you guys realize this, he stopped at 1995. So there's 17 years I got to catch up on and ask him some questions, and it gets even more intense. Wowza. You know, and, and that's one of the things about Alcoholics Anonymous that just absolutely blows me away. You know, you guys are sitting in the homeland of Helen Keller. And to the world, that's an amazing story. And in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, we hear these stories every day. And, you know, the, the rest of the world, Helen Keller's story is amazing. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very moving story. But in AA, Kip's story was very moving, but we can hear those pretty frequently, you know. And uh, it just kind of gives me that moment where I just think how fortunate we are that we were plucked out of the, the throes of hell and have this opportunity to... Uh, you know, sit here, and Charlie and I were talking about y'all, uh, it's, uh, the committee has done such a fabulous job, and it's, it's, it's a breath of fresh air, Alabama is a breath of fresh air, let me tell you, uh, AA's not like this all over the place, AA's wonderful, but, but you guys have got some southern hospitality, you've got some solid AA, and it is just a breath of fresh air to be here, and so I, I just want to thank you and let you know that, you know, Some people don't ever travel outside of their own AA world here. And then if you get the opportunity, too, you get to really see AA all over the place. And it's not, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's pockets of enthusiasm, and you guys are a pocket of enthusiasm, and that's always exciting. Charlie and I's message is very much a message of untreated alcoholism in the rooms of AA. That was our story. You know, I love this line in the book uh, that says, um, most of us know the one in How It Works, where it says, um, I'm going to share my experience of what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now. And the line I actually like is the line that is on page, uh, bear with me here. Got my room key holding one of them. It's on page 29 where it says, Each individual in the personal stories describes in his own language and from his own point of view the way he established his relationship with God. And that's more of how I like to do it. I like to talk more about how I establish this relationship more than qualifying. I would certainly hope that by the time I get behind the podium, you guys have figured I've qualified for Alcoholics Anonymous. And I can tell you that my drinking story is is one of incomprehensible demoralization. And as a woman, I don't really like to share a whole lot of that from the podium. So my stuff is a little bit more about being in Alcoholics Anonymous and what it was like being sober, what it's like being sober, and, and, and untreated alcoholism. And that message is not always very well received. And so, um, you know, you guys have done it with an open heart. You know, it's been it's been really wonderful. So I applaud you. And I, I Lynn has done a fabulous job in, in hosting us. Uh, and Randy and uh, our drive around the town, we've gotten to see where the port, you know, where you lift the ship up and you take the ship down. We've seen the music. We, we did take a quick spin through Helen Keller's place. And uh, we, 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 went, we went like this. Okay, there we well, All righty, there's Helen Keller's spot. Okay. And uh, on the way out, I saw the little water fountain by the by the brick wall, and, and I said, well, I saw the water fountain. They're like, that was not the water fountain. That was a hose, Katie. I said, well, when I go back to Texas, I saw the water fountain, okay? <laughs> not lying. And uh, and then going to Don's place, golly, was that fabulous. Uh, you know, that, 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 uh, that just brings back such memories. You know, you've got a town that's got a lot of... Uh, a lot of cool stuff in it. We've really, really, really enjoyed ourselves. 
Well, let me get on with this deal so I don't burn up too much time. I can certainly tell you I do not have a story like Kip. That is a moving story that he had, and, and uh, I went to bed thinking about it. I woke up this morning thinking about it and did a little prayer about it. You know, and the fact that I, I, I felt very privileged to have been a part of hearing what he had. And if you do a lot of work with alcoholics, you can, you can deal with some people who come in here with grave emotional and mental disorders. And, uh, you know, that line right there really explained it well. And I remember I have one sponsee that has a story that's pretty horrific. And my story's not that horrific. My story, I, I really, really enjoyed all the speakers, and I, I enjoyed Tom. Tom and I share something in common, and that's the fact that we lost somebody, uh, we lost a parent when we were young. And uh, that, that made my direction in life go a certain way. I, there's no doubt about it. You know, you have tragedy when you're a child, and that tragedy will change your life. You have tragedy at any point in your life, and it'll, it'll, do, a, it'll do a detour of some kind, either for the good or for the bad. But I got to, our home group is primary purpose group. We do study the book line by line. And I'll tell you, there was a time in my sobriety I could have cared less. As a matter of fact, there was a time in my sobriety that I was a part of a very sick AA group. I, I love when people say, you know, they're, all AA is good. No, it's not. No, it's not. You know, I was a active member of the sickest group in Austin, Texas. And... uh you know, I, and Bob Darrell and I got in a conversation about this. He goes, you know, Katie, I, 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 have, I struggle when you say that. I go, how can you struggle with my experience, Bob? If you walked in with a big book, we were like, oh, lovely. Here comes somebody coming with what they call solution, you know. And, I mean, our meeting really could have been called in constant collision because that's all we did. We, we complained about you guys in AA, and we got it. And the group stayed very, very small. And that's what a sick meeting will do. It will stay very, very small, and it will never grow. And I had no idea that that's what I was doing. That, hadn't, that was not how I was raised in AA. As a matter of fact, I... I, uh, I'm jumping a little bit ahead. I had, um, I've got to, we have three grandchildren, and uh, I'll tell you, those are God's do-over, aren't they, those grandbabies? I swear for the alcoholic, God gives you a second shot at trying to do it different, you know? And these grandbabies are wonderful. I have a 33-year-old daughter and a 22-year-old son, and, and uh, my daughter has a 5-year-old and a 9-month-old, and my son has an 8-month-old, and it's it's pretty spectacular. And um, I feel very, very fortunate to... Uh, you know, the book says that the best years of our existence lie ahead. And, it well, it says the the um, most satisfying. Thank you, honey. My road man, he's there. He's always there for me. He was over here telling me, you know, you can pull this out, honey. You can do it. I said, just for God's sake, sit down. Okay. Could, <laughs> could you just sit down? About another half a milliliter of a second, I would have had that word, but... He, he, he's helping me out there. And uh, the most satisfying years of our existence lie ahead. And, and one of the things about that is, is that you've got to lay your experience up against that. Is that your experience? Are the most satisfying years of your existence lie ahead? And it doesn't matter when you got sober. That's it. I mean, I'm, I'm 54 years old and I'm, you know, I'm clearly on the back nine. There's no doubt about it. You know, and if you, if you do the, the age, I'm on the back nine. I just hope I'm not putting on the 18th hole. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to life, life going forward and it's, it's been pretty doggone good. And it wasn't always that way. When I was a kid, I was born, I was uh, the third born. And, I, you know, back in the day, that's when everybody was two years apart in the 50s, and, and that's the way the whole deal worked out. You had the stay-at-home mom, and dad went off to work, and, and we were, you know, uh, pretty, what I consider pretty normal family. You know, my dad was a ex-NFL football player, so he liked to party, and my mom enjoyed him partying, and in our, our home, alcohol, you know, just flowed freely. It was uh it was really wonderful. I, I enjoyed when the booze came out because it was fun. Charlie's house was complete Baptist teetotal and just sounded so boring. Oh, my God. When when he tells me his stories, I mean, my dad was just, you know, wow. You know, and we were just always having fun. People coming in. I remember this one woman in a leopard outfit, you know, and, and uh it was it was just life was just what looked to be good. And then all of a sudden my mother got sick and I mean got sick and died. And it was just when I was eight years old. And it was I didn't we were just shocked. It was like, what? And 
back then, nobody, it's not like you did the grief workshops and the grief balloons and the children talk about it and they do scrapbooks. It was, you know, your mother's gone and we're going to be okay. Let's move on from here. And so my dad, in the next 18 months, my dad remarried three times and had four live-in housekeepers. (laughs) I mean, that's no Kip story, but let me tell you, it was devastating to me. (laughs) I mean, they just, one lasted a weekend. I mean, she moved in, six weeks after my mother died, she moved in with her two kids, and then by Sunday, she moved out. It was kind of like, all righty. And then in three months, we had another one. And then in three months, we had another one. And in the midst, we had the four live-in housekeepers. So one of the things that I learned, see, I, 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 when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I would have swore to God that's what made me alcoholic. I was so desperate to find out what made me alcoholic. And I think that's pretty normal. I think that's what we do. Why in the world am I alcoholic? Well, today I believe I got a genetic bullet. Period. It's just, there's alcoholism all through my family. My brother's got it, I got it, and my sister doesn't. And it, and that's all I need to know. But when I came into AA, I was a moral reject. And I really believe that the reason I was a moral reject was because my mother died. And if you had gone through what I went through, you would certainly, you know, have to drink too. And so what ended up happening is, oh, my gosh, I, I remember when I look back at my childhood and, and Tom, you know, was was explaining my life perfectly, I became driven. I was absolutely driven to do the best, be the best, not be the loser. I was going to be it in life. And that's the thing I think, guys, that, you know, uh, the the beauty of your, your past is how does it influence your old ideas, right? We were talking about that in the workshop. I mean, for the longest time, I never even knew what an old idea was. I mean, my dad used to say, if you, you know, if your ass wasn't hooked on, you'd lose it, you know, and I mean, I had all those old ideas that I wasn't much in certain areas, but I didn't have a lot of old ideas. I was so driven to be okay. And I was the kid in school that just, you know, I mean, it was Red Rover, Red Rover, and I'd take your arm off, man, when I came over. You know what I mean? It, it, it was like, whoa, ho, ho, ho. And, and I was just, I remembered thinking it, this, this tension. And it wasn't ADD. It wasn't any of those labels. It was just driven. And I absolutely hated school. And it was interesting because Kip's story is a pretty typical story behind the podium of somebody going back to school. And I can tell you, Thank God for the inventory process. I I ended up leaving home at 15. I was absolutely insane, right? I could not live under any rules. I still don't like rules. I don't know about you guys, but I don't like any rules. I don't like anybody telling me what to do. Am I in the right room of people? Most most people are nodding by this point. Yes, okay. Well, yeah. I'm always worried about that PTA feeling that we can get, you know what I mean? And... Uh, but one of the things is, is that, you know, when I left home at 15 years old, I was the kid that was just absolutely going to get that diploma because I wasn't a loser, but I could have cared less about education. And I, I'm 54 years old, and I have to be honest with you, it, it, it education is not going to make me any different than I am. I don't feel that I robbed myself. If your alcoholism robbed you of your education and you want to go back and get an education, I say more power to you. I did enough inventory work to realize I didn't need it. As a matter of fact, I had a business where I was very, very successful. I did have to be self-employed if you're not going to have much of an education. And and, I, and my husband comes from a family full of education. As a matter of fact, they love the museums. Oh, my God. I swear to God, I'm like, I am like the 12-year-old. When they all go to the museum, I'm like, oh. <laughs> oh. I just, and, and we're, at the, we're at the Alamo and, and, uh, uh, and Charlie goes, please, let's go to the Alamo. And I'm like, oh, I could care less about the Alamo. And, and the guy's telling the story and he's like wiping the tear from his eye and I'm over there just, <laughs> oh, there was a guy from uh, Norway at our meeting and, and uh, I sponsor this little gal and we call each other dumb and dumber. It's a little joke we have. And, and uh, she said, he's, uh, he's from Norwegia. And uh, and I looked at her, and, and there's about three people standing around. I said, oh, for heaven's sakes, he's Norwegian. And I swear, everybody's kind of just looking, giving us that look where you're like, oh. okay, I think we were both off the mark on that one. I'm not sure who, who really was worse. But uh, 
And then Charlie, like I said, he comes from a, a heavily educated background. Let me tell you, you bring those two families together, or do you, me and him, and, and we got some problems, right? And so I'll say to him, honey, how do you spell? And he'll go, well, let's sound it out. I'm like, oh, no, see, I didn't, I didn't ask you to teach me. Just, you know, and that whole, that whole parental tone makes me absolutely crazy. You know, he'll say to me, come over here. I ain't moving, you know. I I even know I need to come over there, and I'm not coming over there. And and that's kind of one of the things that you know. What, these are my old ideas. That that's what we're talking about. So all of my upbringing influenced my old ideas, and I don't even know it because I just packed them in there. Nobody taught them to me. I saw something, assumed something, and stuck it in my bucket. And then I carry that bucket all through life. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm an adult with these ridiculous old ideas when we when I was 12 years old it was very difficult I started drinking at 12 and my mother died at 8 and I'm telling you what I wanted some relief and I had no idea so it's when we say you take that drink and that drink did for me something there was no doubt about it. I remember where I was standing I remember the drink I was drinking and it did for me something that changed and I had no idea that what it was doing was calming the beast of self-centeredness see I missed that for many, many years in AA. I missed that up until about 10 years ago. I had no idea that the ism, that what was driving me, these voices in my head, this insanity to be this, to do this, and then I took that drink and all my problems went away. And so when I was 12, you know, you could drink so much booze out of your parents' liquor cabinet, but then you were going to get caught. We did a tremendous amount of outside issues back then. I grew up in Houston, Texas. They were everywhere. I mean, we were going on the east side. It was it was pretty rough, considering when you look at a 12-year-old today. It, it's shocking, actually, when I start to think about it. But we used to sit in front of the 7-Eleven if we wanted to get booze. And, you know, you were getting the booze farm apple wine and the spinata, and that was kind of the thing happening. And you have to wait for the creepy guy to pull up, you know, and it was the three girls. And I always love this story because, you know, you wait for the creepy guy and you go, oh, that's our guy right there. Yeah. And uh, now we're 12. And uh, we asked the creepy guy if he'll buy some booze. And he's always like, oh, you bet. Right. And then, he, and then the biggest thing we got to do is get rid of creepy guy. Right. I mean, you got to drop creepy guy quickly. And, uh. And that is, it's funny because we'd jump on our bikes. He was always in a car, and we knew we were shooting right to the woods, you know. And, I mean, it was a little bit like E.T., you know, where you're just, you know. And a creepy guy is, you know, trying to keep up with us, and we'd lose him every time. And, and what cracks me up is, you know, creepy guy's sitting in here, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're not fooling me, creepy guy. And I can always spot the creepy guy, you know. Eggs, oh, he's most of the time harmless. Uh, but, you know, my qualifications are that uh, when I start drinking, I can't stop, and I can't stop starting. That was it. When I crossed the invisible line, and it got out of hand, and I had a child. And, you know, Kip's story is, is, the, is what happens when you got kids. you got kids and alcoholism. They don't go well together. You know, they like to get up early. They like to eat. That's a problem. That's a big problem. And, uh, you know, they, they're, they're, the level of controlled drinking with children is very, very difficult. And you're going to leave them unattended. And it gets very, very dark, very dark. And I'll tell you, between outside issues and that child, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous at 26 years old. And when I walked into the rooms, I chased a boy in here, I will tell you that. And uh, I, I, he told me he was sober, and I thought, I don't quite know what that word even means, you know, because I just didn't get it. And so I came into AA, and when I saw what you people looked like and I saw the laughter, I felt like I fell in love. I mean, I was home. And it was that feeling where not everybody has this, man. I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm one of the lucky ones that walked in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and went, I want what you people have. Now, I didn't have a clue what I had. And they explained it to me pretty weakly. And I got it. I don't know how in the world that happens. And some of us are luckier than others. We really, really are. And I love the laughter. And I'll tell you what, I went home that night and five women called me. Five. I, I don't know. I'm, I hope that happens in Alabama. I can tell you that does not happen in Austin, Texas. 
We are way more about, we've kind of gotten so weak in certain areas that we're way more about giving you my phone number. Well, I tell you what, if those five women had given me their phone number, I wasn't calling them. I'm not calling some stranger. I had a good day. Thank you very much. You people are fun. I loved all the laughter, but I'm not picking up the phone calling a stranger on day one of sobriety. I need you to call me. And, you know, I hear people in AA, you know, I thought you guys are so fortunate you have a ton of treatment centers and nothing against the treatment centers, but we got to realize the difference of what treatment is and what AA is. And in AA, we call you. We check on you. We see what you're doing. We don't wait till you're ready. You know, that, that term, that term I think came from treatment. You know, I've, I've, I heard Sponsee say, I don't think they're ready. I, I don't think they're ready at all. And I'm thinking, who, who are you to make that decision? You keep working with them. Bill and Bob constantly went back to those guys in the hospital. They didn't go, no, you know what, that's his fifth time. I'm not going down there today. <laughs> no, we're not working on this. But you know what? I got so deeply involved in Alcoholics Anonymous when I first got here. I was, I, 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 the boy I chased in, he had six years sober. Oh, my God. Was he my God? I mean, it was like I had ten minutes, he had six years, and he kept telling me, Katie, this is not, this is not a good idea. I went, oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. You know that hook that we women set? Reel it in. We're good at that, aren't we? We're reeling it in. And he's like saying, this is not good, Katie. He goes, I got six years. You're brand new sober. You're not really supposed to be dating. You're not supposed to be And I'm like, just chill out. Well, he moved in in about seven days. And so he chilled. And uh, we actually, we got married and we're married for 20 years. And I, I am so grateful that the line in the book that says we are not to be the arbiter of anybody's sex life. You know what? And because now, now trust me, if you're going to get in a relationship in early sobriety, put your seatbelt on, okay? And, and, and put the overstrap and buckle it tight because it's going to be a very bumpy road. But I'm telling you what, Joe was such a big book guy and I just loved it. I would just sit there and remember I didn't have, I have very little education. I can read. I just don't comprehend well. I mean, my big book is marked up so much because that, tells me what page to go to. I don't ever remember the paragraph and the page. And I have certain ways that I've learned how to do the educational aspect of it. But he would read the big book and I would just sit and listen. Oh, I just loved it. I loved it. And I did the conferences and I did the family house. And I mean, I was so involved in service. And he was big about taking you through the steps fast. And the first three years were just magical. And then this is what happens. And this is my experience, but I see it happen a lot is the gifts of AA took me away because we get a ton of wonderful things that come to us. I mean, it's amazing. And what ends up happening is all of a sudden I, I did something that, that I wasn't aware that I was doing. This is a looking back program. But I did AA was for drinking. Counseling was for living. And church was spiritual. And so I, I compartmentalized those three things. And I missed it. And missed it badly. Whereas Charlie's story was about the fact that he, well, he was married 800 times. I guess you picked up on that. Was anybody keeping count? Oh, my God. Every time he'd come to me, he'd have a new girl. And I'm like, oh, could you, could you think with this instead of this? Is there any way? Could we do that? You know, as his best friend and sister, I'm like going, for God's sakes, it wasn't, you know, we're, we're married now. It wasn't out of jealousy. Trust me. I was just wanting him to have a good relationship. And he would pick the craziest girl in AA. And we girls in AA know who that crazy girl is, right? And I, I swear she'd walk in and I'd think, oh, Charlie Parker will get her. Well, I got it. <laughs> he just honed in on the crazier they were, ma'am. Little did I know. That they would be a part of my life today. Lovely. Uh, didn't see that coming. Uh, didn't see Charlie and I ever getting together coming either, trust me. But so Joe and I are, um, I mean, we are doing the deal and everything. And I am working a program based on the abstinence of alcohol. Remember I told you in that third step that I really believe the selfishness and self-centered. I remember looking at that, talking about that, but it wasn't me. I was voted most likable in high school four years in a row. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh-huh. I was, I was uh, the Brazoria County Fair Queen candidate. I, I have quite a big personality, right? And uh, everybody loved me. I got along with every group of people. I'm that kind of gale. I'm, I'm faithful. I'm honest. I'm this. I'm that, right? I'm not selfish and self-centered. I am not stingy, and I am not conceited. And that's exactly what I thought that meant. And so, now, once again, Charlie 
very self-centered. And being my best friend, i that was what I remember thinking. I love him so much, but God Almighty, does he need a lot of work. You know, and I kept telling him, you need to go to this codependency recovery therapy we're going to. This was the 80s. And uh, I said, you really need to go to this codependency therapy, Charlie. And he goes, I am not going to any, don't go, go, hold on to some teddy bear. You know, I'm like, well, he just doesn't get it, you know. And so we, so I was in, literally, in codependency therapy, recovery, group therapy for 10 years. And that is not for sissies, but it also make one sick alcoholic even sicker. And I mean to tell you, I learned some wonderful stuff in there, and I got very, very, very sick in there. And today I can tell you, it's, 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 you, boy, it's this, you know, therapy is a privilege, but it can also make you sick as can be. Because what I ended up doing, like I said, is I did a ton of boundaries, and I did a ton of detachment to people who truly love me. Remember, I suffer from a disease of delusion. And so I make up a storyline and determine if you're out of my life. And you know what? You're out. You're out. You're out. You're not safe for me. You're not good for me. And you can hear, can you hear the self-centeredness in that? And it was, it was pretty crazy. And so then the gifts end up taking me away and Joe says, Hey, honey, let's go, let's go to church. And I'm thinking, mm-hmm, not really a church gal. I, I was raised Catholic and, and you know, they were speaking up. Oh, honey, help me. I, I, now I got Irish on my mind. Latin. Okay. The, I swear to God, two talks ago, I, I put, stuck the word Irish in there and now it won't go away. You know, I'm telling you, you can, you can imagine me in school. It was like, whatever. Uh, so, you know, they're still speaking Latin in the Catholic Church. So my biggest deal was just flicking a booger on my sister. I mean, I don't know about you guys in church, but it was just, you know, I mean, I'm just, you know, you know, and that to me was the highlight of, of going to church. And, uh, you know, and, and I swear, you know, Catholics, gee, man, you got CCD, you got Saturday, you got to go sit in that box and go do your, oh, whatever. You know, and it just, it, it never had a feel for me. And so Joe says, no, Katie okay. goes, hey, wait till you go to this church, man. It's, I went there, you know, when you were gone last weekend and you're going to love it. So we walk into this church. It's non-denominational. They got these big overhead screens, and it's got like eight lines, and people are singing. And I mean, you just repeat those eight lines until you just feel like you're Tina Turner, you know. And you got it. I mean, going on. How many of y'all have done that, where you sing those eight lines, and by the time you are done, you are belting it out, and you sound horrible, but you you are filled with the spirit. And I mean, I looked at Joan and went, oh my God, I love this. This is great. And I'm three years sober. And the next thing you know, man, I mean, I found Jesus. And I mean, wowza. And I know I'm in the South. It was like, ooh, watch how you say that. And trust me, lay, lay it in that Bible belt to Texas too. Everybody's like, did she say Jesus? Was she... She digging Jesus? She not digging Jesus? I can't figure it out. But the truth of the matter is, I mean, I found Jesus, and the next thing you know is I felt I needed to go back to AA and tell everybody, oh, yeah, yeah, we know that gal. We know that guy. It's ugly. It's ugly. And it got uglier and uglier, and you know what? You, 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 you pagans just didn't get it. And, uh, and I would talk to the minister, and he'd say, you know, love the, love the sinner, hate the sin. And I'd think, I hate the sinner. Okay, I'm not getting that. <laughs> I'm not getting that at all. And uh, what ended up happening is we, uh, we, we walked away from AA, and we went to church for three years. And trust me, guys, I am not the, you know, we agnostic says, oh, don't do that. As a matter of fact, it's in conjunction with, right? It's never in place of. I see people pray and meditate their way out through um, Eastern religion. It, it goes either way for us. When, when it says we are an extreme example of self-will run riot, that's what it looks like. I mean, I found something I liked, and I just held on to it until it made me crazy. And at six years sober, I was absolutely stark raving sober, crazy as could be, crazy as could be. I'd run everybody off in AA except Charlie. And, and I don't know how, because, man, he was like, you know, you and your Jesus freak stuff is making me crazy. I mean, my husband and I, we, you know, we morph into what we dig, right? And, I mean, we looked Amish in one picture. 
and uh, you know, I mean, I'm a little, I'm a little street crazed gal anyway. I left home at 15. Trust me. I mean, I, I know how to, I know how to run something if necessary. And I mean, I even started wearing underwear. Okay, there you go. That's, that's a big deal. And uh, one of the things, though, that I had thought was happening is, you know, the line in the book that says, "For if an alcoholic failed to enlarge his spiritual life," and there was a period there, is what I thought. Now, that's not what the book says. But that's what I saw, that's what I read, that's what I thought. Remember, AA was for drinking, living was codependency recovery, and church was for my spiritual growth. I thought that was seeking for me. Now, now that may be for you, but that's not my experience. And so I told Joe, I said, well, I'm sitting in an intersection, and I'll never forget this. It was when turning right on red was the brand new law, which I, for you younger kids probably don't even get that. But uh, that was a big deal. And, you know, you might think the iPhone is a big deal. Turning right on red is a big deal. And this woman is in front of me, and she is a, an elderly woman, and she is not taking a right on red. And I'm six years sober with Jesus, and um, I need to teach this woman a lesson. And I consider nudging her right into that intersection. Just, mm-hmm. And it's all under the cloak of Jesus. This would be, you know what I mean? And I mean, I am just gripping that wheel and thinking, get move, you know. And this is probably a minute, just a minute. And that's how wound tight I am. See, we alcoholics walk away from those 12 steps, and, man, we get wound tight quick. And I get home, and I tell Joe, man, I am not doing good. I am almost pushed an elderly woman into an intersection by not turning right on red. And he said, you know, honey, I'm not doing well either. And I said, well, what should we do? And he goes, we need to go back to AA. And I love that relationship. That relationship was amazing in that arena. He said, I said, okay. We jumped in the car. We headed down to the noon meeting that we used to go to. We walked in there, sat down. There was old Ed H., you know, the guy who whacks that big old Rolex, you know. And we saw these people and everything. And I said to Joe, I leaned over and I said, oh, my God, honey, we're home. We're home. And that feeling was just so clear to me. And I'd love to say that life went great from that point on. But what I didn't get was it's it's what I call meeting-based sobriety. I didn't know that at the time. But I'm six years sober. Joe always had six years more than me, and he had 12 years sober. And you can't tell somebody with time anything. I'm telling you, you can't. You know, it's like this this uh, barricade where I go, oh, no, I don't like that. Okay, I'll let a little bit of that. No, mm, don't like that one. You know, I mean, I don't know that I'm doing this, but that's what I was doing. And so what we did is is we uh, we went to a lot of meetings, and I'm not knocking meetings. Oh, my God, I love the unity. I love the fellowship. I, I say if you want to go to a meeting a day, go to a meeting a day, but don't let that be for your recovery from alcoholism. Right. It was Don and I were talking about this. He says, we we have a meeting based on solution only, not the problem. And if I'm not careful, I'm so self-centered. All I'll do is talk about the problem. I was the guy at every meeting that just first one to raise my hand. Are you in the room? First guy to raise their hand, man, I couldn't wait to talk about me, me. Come on. And then sometimes I'd try to be humble and be the third one. Yeah, that's what I thought humility looked like, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, you know, self will run riot. And so what I was getting from these meetings was relief, but not the freedom. And I didn't know that now because you can get relief. But I, what I understand today is that I am the vessel, right? I am the vessel to get you connected to the power. God said, or in the big book, it says that we have been given the power to help another drunk. But we're beyond human aid. I absolutely cannot get you sober. But I can get you connected to the power that can get sober. Now, see, at this point, Joe and I were just running together, right? And so I'm not really using a sponsor. I know that's not the best thing. I've I've not really made all my amends. I've just done the tornado amends, you know, to the family. I have worked a very, very weak AA program. And I got most of my AA from the... Uh, from the uh, meetings. If you read the book, thank God, because you need to quote the book. And do you know how many people quote the book incorrectly? Holy smokes. You know what? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. As a matter of fact, I was really relying on you people. Come on. Come on. Read that thing. Read it and bring it. Read it and bring it. And so 
uh, I, I loved it. Well, I read this yesterday, and it's a very important part of the book. It says, page 25, if you are a serious alcoholic as we were, we believe there is no middle-of-the-road solution. Well, meeting-based sobriety, middle-of-the-road, call it whatever you want. But I'm sitting in AA not doing anything but meetings. And one of the things that I think is very misunderstood for me is that people say, um, well, you know, I hadn't seen Tom. He's not doing meetings anymore. And so we almost make it sound like meetings are treatment for alcoholism. I mean, that would certainly be what it is. And, and meetings are a part of our triangle, the unity. It's crucial that you be in the herd. It's crucial that you have service. But recovery is the bottom part of that triangle. And it's the 12 steps that treat alcoholism, right? We, we, we talked about this yesterday, is that if we believe we suffer from alcoholism and the treatment for alcoholism is the 12 steps and we are not working the 12 steps, then we are not treating our alcoholism. People call it dry, flat periods, whatever. I like to call it untreated alcoholism because, as you'll hear in my story, it gets really close to home for me, very, very close to home. And so we were in a position where life was becoming impossible. And if we had passed into the region from which there is no return through human aid, we had but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out our consciousness of our intolerable situation, and the other was to accept spiritual help. And I tell you, intolerable situation is not unusual for us alcoholics. We can make anything miserable. We can make wonderful things miserable. And that's just, you know, welcome to our fellowship. That's just kind of what we do. And so, little do I know, I'm stark raving sober. And, and here's the deal. When, when, for me, when I was uh, in this position... People were asking me to sponsor them, and I was doing a level of sponsorship, but I was a slogan slinger. I was, let it go, turn it over. Love and tolerance is our code. That one is the one I always love when somebody's talking uh, some smack about someone. Don't you love that? Oh, that's a level of humility. Thank you so much for sprouting wings in front of me. You know, have you ever done that? Have you ever been standing there talking smack about somebody? They go, love and tolerance is our code. And now I just want to kill you too, you know. And, and today I understand when that happens, what is my responsibility to say, wow, it sounds like you got a resentment. You want to do a quick four-column inventory? I'll take you out back. I'll do that in a heartbeat. You know, but I will not lob out the promises expecting the steps to come true. You know, a, when, I, when somebody has a real problem and they're driven by a hundred forms of fear and I say, let it go, I really think I'm doing them a disservice. I need to tell them what the step would be to get them to be able to let it go, right? And and so I didn't realize that, and Charlie stole my favorite line, is that, that that you would be working the promises hoping the steps would come true. But that's what I was doing, and that's I didn't I didn't know that. How do you know what you don't know? I mean, everybody's got good intentions. But today now, boy, I hear anybody. I mean, I'll go out, I'll step outside real quick, and we'll do a quick four-column inventory. And I mean, to watch the freedom. Remember, God said, you've been given the power to help a drunk. Use it, Katie. Don't just, you know, the new guy's in the room and pat him on the shoulder and say, keep coming back. Take your time outside. Take him outside. I like to do that. When there's a new guy in the room, and I, uh, I say guy, but new gal, if there's a new gal in the room, I don't let her sit in a meeting. I take her outside and give her a first-step experience. I talk about the allergy. I talk about the obsession. She can go to meetings. She can go to another meeting in three hours. But I, I, I want her to get what the book is saying as quickly as we possibly can. Get her into the herd, right? I'm a big fan of the herd. Well, little do I know, all of a sudden now I start getting the bedevilments on me. The bedevilments are on page 52. Now, you can stay sober in Alcoholics Anonymous for a long, long time just going to meetings. And I can tell you, I did it for 10 years. And, and if you would have hooked me up to a lie detector test before the bedevilments came in, I would have told you life was pretty doggone good. I mean, I had my therapy for when I had my real problems. And I, I loved my AA friends, and I loved AA. But the bedevilments are on page 52. And the bedevilments are so sneaky because you don't even realize you got them. It actually gets almost as comfortable as the alcoholic life, right? And it says... uh we were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional nature. We were prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to others. 
That is the bedevilments that I can tell you what are available to me any time I step away from these 12 steps. And I didn't know that at the time. And so I'm living in these bedevilments, and all of a sudden my husband uh, gets sick. And now we've been married for about 15 years, and he gets sick, and we can't figure out what it is. And it seems to be a level of depression that is bizarre. I mean, he can't remember where he's driving. He's got all kinds of things going on. So we, we are both in, uh, we're both self-employed and we both have catastrophic insurance. And, you know, the doctor, the, the psychiatrist is saying, you know, he needs to go get some testing. And I'm thinking, testing? What kind of testing? Do we, what, do we just go into the hospital? And, I mean, you could pay $5,000 or $50,000. Any of y'all know that? You talk about driven by fear. Man, I am scared to death. My husband is sick and I don't know what's wrong. And so my girlfriend at the AA club says, um, you know, Katie, you could drive a school bus and get instant insurance. Well, you know, I'm a doer. What, what's it gonna, what's it gonna take? And I said, really? Just, just driving a school bus? And she said, yes. I said, okay, I can do this. So I go down there to get the job. Now let me tell you something. My mission was to get the insurance. I didn't care about the school system. I didn't care about putting that bus company out. I didn't care about the children. I didn't care about any, because when I'm driven, I am so self-centered, I'm going to get the insurance for my husband so we can figure out what's wrong with his head. Are you with me on that? I'm, sure, I'm assuming most of you guys have been driven before. Yeah, <laughs> you know that feeling. So I go down there, I end up getting this bus job, and I mean, I tell Joe, okay, we got insurance, instant instant HMO. Go into that uh, doctor's office and get a get a uh, MRI. Well, he, oh, he was so sick, he just couldn't even seem to pull that simple task off. So I said, you know what? Get in the car, we're going down to the emergency room, and you're getting your head scanned. And and see, I'm, I'm a take charge gal because I'm driven. Do I need it done? I'm getting it done. So we go down there, and I tell him on the way down there, I say, now let me tell you something, Joe. That doctor's probably going to ask you some questions like touch your elbow, and I want you to touch your nose. And he's going to say, touch your nose. I want you to touch your elbow. We have to fail this test, okay? Because, you know, remember, we work all angles. We're thinking ahead. We're, th we're thinkers. So we get in there, and I don't know how I knew this, but we got in there, and that doctor walks in, and I swear, all it takes is a white coat and that authority figure. And I'm like, okay, let's just bring it, okay? Bring it. And the guy goes, so you think he's got something in his brain? And I'm like, yes, he does. You know, and in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm driving a damn school bus. You just get him in that tube. I don't care what it takes. You know? Jesus. How hard is this? And so the guy starts asking Joe questions, and he says, hey. He goes, okay, I need you to, um, Joe, he goes, well, touch your nose. And Joe looks over at me, and he goes, oh, my God. I mean, oh, my God. And I, I think, you're blowing the test, man. And And the guy says, touch your elbow. And he's like. And the doctor's looking at me like, and I thought, okay, that's it. And I swear, I'm going to plan B. I'm thinking, okay, I'll knock the doc out. I'll take the white coat. I'll shove him in the tube myself. I'll hit every button. We're going to get that brain scan. Because by this point now, I am stark, raven, sober, crazy. Are you with me? I know you're the, out there. I know who I'm talking to is out there. And so I am driven by getting my husband's brain scanned. Next thing you know, the guy asked several questions. You know, I asked him to add two plus two, and he can't do it. And he goes, you know what, we're going to go ahead and scan his brain. And I thought, oh, thank you. I could have saved you 25 minutes there. That took forever. And so they take Joe, and they go scan his brain, and they come back in, and, and that doctor walks in, puts his hand right here on my shoulder, and he goes, my God, he goes, he's got a gigantic mass in his brain. He said, I've, I've never seen a mass that big. And my very first thought was, I am going to be driving this damn school bus for the rest of my life. See, that's how self-centered I am. That, I didn't go that, I didn't go down that road. And of course I didn't say anything. I didn't look at you and go, oh great. Now I'm going to be driving this stupid bus. You know, of course I didn't do that. But those are the voices in my head. And so we went, and he, he, of course, he wasn't leaving the hospital, man. We had massive, massive surgery planned in three days. And they had told us that he basically was going to die, but we didn't hear that. And the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is so fantastic. Oh, my God. We, we had, at any given time, we had 25 people in the room. It was just, it was just fabulous. And Joe had this surgery done, and 
and we weren't quite sure. They kept saying quality of life is 15 months, and I thought that just meant it was going to be hell for 15 months, and, and then it'd be okay. And, and they do this surgery, and the doctor comes out, and he says, now, I'm not going to tell you anything about this brain tumor until we get the test run. After it's done, he was in surgery for 11 hours. And uh, the doctor comes out, and he goes, my God, it's benign. And I'm like, I thought you said you weren't going to tell me. And he goes, no, he goes, it's a meningioma. I can't believe it. I've never seen one that large. Matter of fact, we're sending it off to this institution to say, you know, oh, well, good, you know, and all this stuff. And so he ends up, uh, so Joe's not going to die. He doesn't have uh, cancer. Unbelievable. I mean, and from that point on, guys, I'd love to tell you that we were given so many amazing gifts But remember, we were in untreated alcoholism. We did not have a safety net. Our net was gone. And I didn't think that AA had to offer what I needed. I was still actively involved in the fellowship. I had three blow-in-the-bag anxiety attacks. Absolute blow-in-the-bag anxiety attacks. matter of fact, you do not want to ask somebody with brain damage to give you a bag. He gave me a uh, plastic bag. That's why I'm like... (laughs) You know, oh, my God, you know, and you you don't get to, you know, when you're having one of those blow in the bag anxiety attacks, you don't get to go, uh, sh- excuse me, I need a paper bag. You know, I mean, you are losing it. Right. And I, of course, went to the doctor and he, of course, put me on an antidepressant. Of course he did. Now, I'm telling you guys, and this is my experience, and I'm not knocking if you should be on antidepressants. We're not doctors. I'm all about that. I get that. But I'm telling you. I was in untreated alcoholism. The antidepressant was not my cure at that point. I was on it for a very short period of time. I hated the way it made me feel. It made me feel flat. Did not like that at all. And so what ended up happening is Joe and I are trying to make this life. We go six years into this world, right? And we're, I don't, I don't know that AA is available through those 12 steps. It never occurs to me that I'm not working the 12 steps. I got big problems. So what do you have to do, man? You end up having to go to a meeting that is pretty sick. You're not going to go to a solution-based meeting. And so I get very involved in this very, very sick meeting and I'm riding that, driving that damn school bus. Oh, my God, I could tell you guys school bus stories. Can you see me driving a school bus? Okay, I have been in the fitness business for 30 years. I am just fitting the school bus in, right? And let me tell you, if I need to get to my class, I am driving that school bus about 90 miles an hour. You know, and I mean, I am absolutely crazy. I did add a little bit of flavor to the bus, but, you know, I mean, I am telling you what. Oh. You know, you're out at 5.30 in the morning whacking those wheels with a stick, listening for some thug that I, I felt, you know, thump noise. I'm like, whatever, pump, 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 pump. Did you see me do it? Okay, good deal. I get on the bus. I asked for a gas bus because I like to drive very fast. I did not want the diesel bus, and they have governors on them, and the gas buses don't have governors on them, right? And, you know, you, you put an alcoholic behind the wheel of that bus, oh, my God. And I am telling you, there was one spot, there was these two dips. And uh, <laughs> and uh, these there was five little boys that were always left on my bus, and they'd say, "Miss Kate, come on, come on, come on!" And I could get them in the back seat, and I could gas it over those dips and shoot them about four seats up. Man, you know what? And they just, Whoa! you know, oh, it was just fabulous. And so one day, you know, and I didn't do it often because if anybody was watching, you know, I'd be in trouble. I'd lose the bus job. I'd lose my insurance. You know, I mean, I got to have some level of responsibility here. You know. So I tell them one day, they go, Miss Kate, please, please, please. I go, okay, 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 get in the back. Okay, ready? And I mean, I gas it, and right after you hit the two humps, you have to come to an immediate stop because it, it uh, T-boned, and you have to take a right. And so I come over those two humps, and I hit the brakes, and all of a sudden the valve stems blow off the back end of the bus. The wheels come down. I'm like, oh, oh my, what happened? And I get out, and I swear to God, I mean, I'm looking, I go, oh, my God. Four valve stems are blown off. Oh, my God. So I'm like, uh, tur- turtle bus to base, turtle turtle bus to base. And the kids, I swear, like, pew. And they come, yeah, yeah, this base. I said, base, I don't know what happened, man. I just came over a hill, and all my valve stems blew off in the back of the bus. 
And I swear, when Billy came out there, he looked at me and he goes, they just blew off? Uh, yes, they did. And I swear to God, I will never tell you the truth right now. You know what I mean? See, I, my life is on the line with my insurance. I will lie at 15 years sober. You know what I mean? Well, that's not the end of it. Oh, no, no, no. Now, I'm crazy as can be, right? You're not supposed to drive the bus anywhere. You're supposed to go pick up the kids and take the bus back to the bus yard. Well, I need to vote. And... uh there is no way I'm going to be able to vote in between everything. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to swing the bus by the voting booth and run in there real quick and vote, and nobody will know. Well, I go in there to do it, and I jump off the bus, I run in there, and I'm, you know, the line is too long, and go, you know, and I vote real quick, and I come out, and I have left my reds on. Do you know what that means? There is a line of cars about two miles long. Because <laughs> my stop sign is out, and nobody... Nobody's passing that stop sign. Yeah, my little sneak in there and nobody noticed me. Yeah, it's like a two-mile line of cars. Oh, my God. Is anybody, but you see, you, it doesn't matter if somebody's in the bus or not. You can't pass the Reds. That's a ticket. And, and I know they're thinking, there's a cop hiding somewhere. I know. They're just waiting. They got a camera, you know. Oh, my gosh, I could just go on and on there. And then there, there I, I will tell one more story, and then I'll move on. But it is the part that you laugh a lot, and that's always good for us. Uh, there was one guy, you know, every morning, you usually run past the same people because everybody's got their mornings going on. There was a guy in a BMW that just was dying to pass my bus. I mean, if he saw me coming, if he went fast enough, he could go past me before I hit the yellows and the reds, right? And I hated that because he would speed past kids standing at the bus stop, right? It just, it just was wrong. So I would purposely, the minute I saw him, hit my reds. I could be, I could be 50 feet from the bus stop. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll drive with my door open. And I swear to God. And he would look at me and he'd go like this. I'd go. <laughs> oh my God. I was absolutely crazy. Mm, mm. Well. One of the terms I like to use a lot when I am run on self-will is I'm in over my head. Any of y'all use that one? Oh, this is not a good, I'm in over my head. I'm doing too much. And one of the things that I did is I, I on that school bus, I said, my God, I'm in over my head. And I, I drove that school bus for three years. That was a long run. And Joe got sicker and sicker. And he had some very serious brain damage. He had no physical damage, but he has pretty serious brain damage. And unbeknownst to me, he convinced doctors to get a lot of medication. And I did not know that was going on. And within six years, he was he was full-blown using. And uh, the, the most heartbreaking part of this story is that uh, I got a phone call, and he had died of a heroin overdose. And, you know, when I talk about untreated alcoholism, guys, it's we, we don't mess around with that. We're beyond human aid. And and when we're sitting in the rooms and I can ask you a series of about five questions and tell you you're you're in some shark infested waters and you don't even know it. And and it's 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 very common in our rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Joe and I were Mr. and Miss AA. We were active members of the, the fellowship, but that was what we were. We did not have a twelve step program going. We didn't really need one because we'd been sober long enough. And sobriety was about drinking. And we're not drinking. See how we got so screwed up? Well, the rest of that line on page 14 says, For if an alcoholic fails to enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he cannot handle certain trials and low spots ahead. That was a certain trial and low spot, let me tell you. When Joe got sick, we had no safety net. And that's the part that is where I always try to get somebody. If You know, I asked God and said, this is a message that's not always the funny one all the way through, and it's not got everybody rolling in the aisles. But he says, just grow in understanding and effectiveness, Katie, and you will touch the person you need to touch. And remember that, that line that Charlie used. He says, we'll get relief. We'll get relief knowing that the solution is there. And then we'll leave. This has been a fabulous weekend. And then you'll leave and you'll go out there. And, and what you won't realize is you'll get back into your life. And you'll drift away from that relief you got. You didn't get the freedom. You didn't get plugged in. And the only way to do it, and Kip was so strong about this, this is a program of action. 
This doesn't mean go get into service. I mean, if you want to get into service, more power to you. Go get, go be the GSR. Go be the treasurer. Go be the secretary. That's all very good. Get into the program of the, go, go get into the work of the book. That is what I didn't, didn't get. And today, the God of my understanding, oh my gosh, you guys, he is so crazy about Katie. He, he has my back 110%. I thought I'd been rocketed into the fourth dimension when the obsession to drink was lifted. That to me was what I thought was the fourth dimension. Don't, don't get me wrong. That's huge. But that was so the beginning. So what I ended up doing is, is, you know, I, I, I relied, I, I put everything up against drinking. And so I moved right here. I moved out of the ghetto right here. Now, I could hear the gunshots and the kids crying, but right here was pretty doggone good because it wasn't as bad as this. But I had no idea that God had this mansion, unbelievable mansion, and my husband missed it. He absolutely missed it. And you almost lost me had it not been for Charlie. Oh, my God. You talk about best friends. This word really gets emotional. Charlie Parker was my best friend. And I told him one time, he said, the monkey's on my back again. The obsession to drink came back. And I had so much pride that I wasn't going to drink. My God, I might kill myself, but I am not drinking. I was the guy that was going to kill herself. And Charlie's like, he had no program either. He hates when I say that, but he didn't. He was an untreated alcoholism too. Okay, there you go. There's the truth. And so what he says to me, he says, he goes, well, don't drink without me. Oh, okay. You know, and I swear to God, for some reason that worked for a little while. It really did. You know, God takes up so much slack. And that's when he said, it was so bizarre because he says, um, he goes, Katie, you want to go to a big book weekend? No, no, absolutely not. I have no desire to go to a big book weekend. And he goes, no, really. He goes, let's go. This Mark H. guy is supposed to be really amazing. Mark Houston, you know, let's go do it. Oh, whatever. You can't tell Charlie Parker no. Okay, fine. We get in the car, and we get up there, and he, he puts on Chris Raymer's CD. And I got to tell you something, and I love Chris Raymer, but I hated his guts that day. I mean, he put on Chris Raymer, and I remember thinking, I kept turning it off, and I'd say, oh, who is this guy? You know, rah, 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 rah. and Charlie goes, could we just listen to the man? I'm like, well, whatever. He put him back on about another eight seconds. I'd go, who, who is he to say this, 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 and this? You know, and oh, I am not digging this guy at all. We end up going to see Mark. We end up listening to the rest of Chris Raymer. We go see Mark, and all of a sudden, it's like Charlie said, he leaned over and, and he goes, my God, what book is he reading out of? I said, I've never heard this stuff. But now here's the deal about alcoholism and alcoholics. Even if you cannot stay sober and you've been hanging around AA, you know solution when you hear it. You know solution when you hear it. And I, I heard solution. And I remembered thinking, too bad Joe misses. I think Mark Houston could have been the, the one that had the power to get him connected to the power, right? He's been given the power to give. He's the vessel. And so we end up going home, and I go back to that sick meeting, right? Because that, that was my home group. If you if you go call it a home group, we had no group conscience. I just called it a home group because I showed up every day. And uh, I had no idea I was supposed to be a part of a group conscience. There's a lot I didn't know. And um, so I go to that meeting, and I listen to that hour-long meeting. Oh, my God. We never did speak of alcoholism. We never did speak of the solution. And I said, that little jerk from that CD was right. It was as if he had pulled the curtain back. And I went, my God, there is something here. There really is something here. And that began our journey. And let me tell you something. I got a hold of a gal in AA that I knew was, she didn't really, she wasn't the big book thumper. She wasn't anything, but it just felt like God was telling me to get her. And Joe had been dead for about 18 months, man. And I said, uh, I told her, I called her up and I was just, bitching about something you know it's just not fair and this is happening and Charlie and I are dating and I just want to kill him I just want to kill him he's a safe person to kill because he's my best friend you know he ain't going anywhere and uh, I'd have run any other man off let me tell you I was not easy and uh, and I called Marty and I'm telling her all this stuff about you know all this blah 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 and how much pain I'm in and she said Katie I want you to read page 60 to 63 and I remember thinking, whatever, that must be the part of the book that says some of us have it harder than others. And that, you know, 
that we're just going to take a little bit longer. And I just knew that had to be in the book somewhere. And uh, and this is all happening all about the same time, right, that we've met Mark. And, you know, I'd love to say from that day forth, I just grabbed the book. It, it was a little bit of a slow go. And I opened the book. I opened it to page 62 where it says selfishness and self-centeredness that we think is the root of our problem. And I thought, well, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of cussing from the podium, but I'll tell you, I, I, my first thought was, well, that bitch. She didn't hear a word I said. I called her back. See, that's what I do. I don't just sit there and, you know, be mad at her. I pick up the phone. I go, well, are you sure you had the right pages? You know, I mean, did you not hear a word I said? And she said, Katie, there's a fine line between sorrow and self-pity. And I'm afraid you stepped into self-pity. And, you know, when when Kip was, Kip was talking last night about that level of self-pity, that he could not drink enough to get rid of that pain, that's what it is. And if you're not careful, the rest of the world will tell you you deserve to be in some pain. You've had it tough. <laughs> Dangerous place for us alcoholics to go. Because we just make a little bed in that spot, right? And that's self-pity. And that's when that second surrender became so alive. That understanding. And my sponsor makes me live in 60 to 63. It's the explanation of what self looks like. Because I didn't get it. I never understood it. Remember, I don't think too much of myself or too little of myself. All I think about is me. It's knee deep in my DNA. That's what I do. And then the fourth step, what I love so much about the fourth step is it, it is a consideration of how Katie shows up in life. How in the world am I supposed to take something to God that I don't even know I do? I do what I do because that's who I am, right? And that's all I know to do. I have no experience in doing nothing. I'm a doer. That's all I ever do. I have a hard work ethic. How many of you guys know that one? We, we work hard. You bet. I show up. I mean, working hard is not my problem. Working too much can be my problem. But not working, you know, I mean, I got I got so many convoluted ideas. And I love the seventh step where it says that we're to take the good and the bad of me. That's explaining that I don't even know what's good or bad. In the fourth step, it tells me I'm going to look at it from an entirely different angle. What angle is that? The angle of the other person. Oh, I never considered that. I only consider my angle. And my angle's always coming. It's, you know, I love this line where I always thought life was coming at me. It's coming from me. So all of this stuff is coming from me. You know, I love the lines where it says I'm a self-seeker even when trying to be kind, a producer of confusion rather than harmony. Where did I set the ball rolling? My troubles are of my own making. If I want to be free, God always tells me, you know what, Katie, that didn't go very well. You didn't handle yourself well at all. What can we learn from this? And then all of a sudden it's okay. It's okay if you're upset with me. You know what I mean? Now, let me tell you, that takes me about 24 hours to get through. Huh. Wouldn't that be wonderful to do that quick? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. That is 24 hours of head chatter, writing, calling my sponsor, getting this. Because the truth of the matter is, we all want everybody to like us. We really do. We'll say, I don't care if they like me. Oh, really? Let's watch you with that one. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, we all say these things. We are the egomaniacs with a, a, a inferiority complex. You know what I mean? I mean, we are, you know, we have fear of abandonment. I love that one, you know, where they, they she, you get with the new sponsee. She goes, I have fear of abandonment. I went, welcome to AA. You know, who doesn't? You know, we all suffer from these things. And the beauty of the 10th step, and I'll wrap it up in this, the beauty of the 10th step, guys, is about, it's me. It says that I am to watch for resentment, dishonesty, selfishness, and fear. Not wait for it. And Charlie and I do competitive shotgun shooting. Can you see that? Could we be two better people with shotguns? I have, I drive a sports car and I got a shotgun in the trunk. I love it. I am from Texas. And, uh, you know, I, I pulled up to the Starbucks and this guy goes, man, is that a CD player? I said, no, that's the end of my shotgun. He goes, really? <laughs> Yes, it is. Uh, but, you know, when it says that we are to watch for this, it, see, I'm going to get angry. I can't afford to stay angry. And I, I can't just call my sponsor. A, a tenth step is a beautiful tool because, you know, people think it's the evening review. It's not the evening review. It is a spot check inventory throughout the day. The 12 and 12 muddied the waters. It, so read the book to be sure you're clear on this. And one of the reasons I'm so adamant about saying that is because I believe that this disease is genetic. And if my grandchildren have it, I want to be darn sure the 10th step is a spot check inventory when they grow up. Are you with me on that? 
Yes. Okay. So, so I'm a little, I'm a little bit, you know, of a, 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 a what is the word? And don't you tell me. Uh, the when you are. Um, oh, stop it! Stop it! Uh, oh, I forgot the word. I am just tired. But it's the one where I like the way that the I, I like the way the steps are written. I like keeping them in exact form that they are in. And uh, so one of the things is is the ten step says that we are to watch for these things. Now let me tell you guys, when it says to watch for them, and when they crop up, I don't know about you, they crop up every day. Every day I get resentful. Every day I am dishonest. I believe a delusional lie. I may not flat out lie. I am always selfish in my thinking, and I am usually fairly afraid. And so when these crop up is my barometer to determine, oh, if it stays in my head 15 minutes, I better call my sponsor. If all I get is relief from her and not freedom, then I better write a four-column inventory. And then I call her back and we go through that inventory because magic happens for us alcoholics. We alcoholics are missing a lot of filters, man. And I don't believe in my experience that they come back. And I think if you think they come back, then you might be a little uh, delusional, you know. The book says that we will not be inspired at all times. We cannot rest on our laurels. I mean, these things just go through my head like this. But if you scare me, watch me behave, man. I, you threaten anybody in my life, you watch me. I gotta do a lot of work to just not react. And it doesn't just go away. And I'll end on this reading. It happens to be a, I love the, 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 um, what it says in this reading. I'm not the, the biggest fan of the book it came from, so I'm just gonna leave that alone. What glorious mysteries paradoxes are, they do not compute. Yet when recognized and accepted, they reaffirm something in the universe beyond human logic. When I face a fear, I am given courage. When I support a brother or sister, my capacity to love myself is increased. When I accept pain as a part of the growing experience of life, I realize a greater happiness. When I look at my dark side, I am brought into a new light. When I accept my vulnerabilities and surrender to a higher power, I am graced with the unforeseen strength. I stumbled through the doors of AA in disgrace, expecting nothing from life, and I have been given hope and dignity. Miraculously, the only way to keep this gift of the program is to pass it on. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a wonderful weekend. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.